All About a Dog by A.J. Gardiner. It was a bitterly cold night, and even at the far end of the bus, the east wind that raved along the street cut like a knife. The bus stopped, and two women and a man got in together and filled the vacant places. One young woman was dressed in seal skin and carried one of those little Pekingese dogs that women in seal skin like to carry in their laps. The conductor came in and took the fares. Then his eyes rested with cold malice on the beady-eyed dog. I saw trouble brewing. This was the opportunity for which he had been waiting, and he intended to make the most of it. I had marked him as the type of what Mr. Wells had called the resentful employee, the man with a general vague grievance against everything and a particular grievance against passengers who came and sat in his bus while he shivered at the door. You must take that dog out, he said with sour venom. I shall certainly do nothing of the kind. You can take my name and address, said the woman, who had evidently expected the challenge and knew the reply. You must take that dog out. That's my order. I won't go on the top in such weather. It would kill me, said the woman. Certainly not, said her lady companion. You've got a cough as it is. It's nonsense, said her male companion. The conductor pulled the bell and the bus stopped. This bus doesn't go until that dog is brought out. And he stepped on to the pavement and waited. It was his moment of triumph. He had the law on his side and a whole bus full of angry people under the harrow. His embittered soul was having a real holiday. The storm inside rose high. Shameful. He's no better than a dictator. Why isn't he in the army? Call the police. Let's all report him. Let's make him give us our fares back. For everybody was on the side of the lady and the dog. That little animal sat blinking at the dim lights in happy unconsciousness of the rumpus, of which he was the cause. The conductor came to the door. What's your number? said one passenger, taking out a pocketbook with a gesture of terrible things. There's my number, said the conductor imperturbably. Give us our fares back. You've engaged to carry us. You can't leave us here all night. No fares back, said the conductor. Two or three passengers got out and disappeared into the night. The conductor took another turn on the pavement, and then went and had a talk with the driver. Another bus, the last on the road, sailed by, indifferent to the shouts of the passengers to stop. They stick by each other, the villains, was the comment. Someone pulled the bell violently that brought the driver round to the door. Who's conductor of this bus? He sneered and paused for a reply. None coming from the passengers. He returned to his seat and resumed drumming a rhythm on the steering wheel. There was no hope in that quarter. A policeman strolled up and looked in at the door. An avalanche of indignant protests and appeals burst on him. Well, he's got his rules, you know, he said genially. Give your name and address. That's what he's been offered, and he won't take it, said the lady. Oh, said the policeman, and he went away and took his stand a few yards down the street, where he was joined by two more constables. And still, the little dog blinked at the lights, and the conductor walked to and fro on the pavement, like a captain on the quarter deck in the hour of victory. A young woman, whose voice had risen high above the gale inside, descended on him with an air of threatening and slaughter. He was immovable, as cold as the night and as hard as the pavement. She passed on in a fury of impotence to the three policemen, who stood like a group of statuary up the street watching the drama. Then she came back, imperiously beckoned to her young man who had sat a silent witness of her rage and vanished. Others followed. The bus
bus was emptying. Even the dashing young fellow who had demanded the number and who had declared he would see this thing through if he sat there all night had taken an opportunity to slip away.